The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw there had been only one boat. They also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into their boats and went to Capernaum, looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw me, saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God, the Father, has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one who has set, he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so we may see and believe you? They asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. Then they said, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Father in heaven, Lord, you are a good and wonderful God. You are so gracious and kind towards, towards undeserving people. Lord, I do not have the capacity within myself to teach anything um, and that it would have any effect. But Lord, if, if uh, I would be able to exposit your word true and clear, may it have your desired impact on the hearers tonight. Lord, for those who are Christian here, may it bring great comfort and may it challenge them. And for those who aren't Christian here tonight, Lord, Lord, may it show that you are a good God who offers yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, in case you are unaware, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm sorry, I wasn't in the announcement part of the section, but tonight we are starting a new series, and this series is called the I Am Series. Um, this is uh, a mini-series in, in the book of John that covers these sayings that were given by Jesus. And the sayings um, deal with something that uh, Jesus was describing about himself. Now, usually when it comes to... Sorry, I'm just going to make sure that this is on. There we go. So usually when it comes to the Gospels and encountering the Bible, often we end up encountering the ideas of what people thought about Jesus. And even in our passage tonight, we have in John chapter 6, a number of different people who thought different things about Jesus. Um, For example, in verse 14, they thought that Jesus was a prophet. Uh, Verse 25, they, they recognized Jesus as a rabbi. In verse 42, they recognized Jesus as the son of Joseph. But then you had other people, like Peter, for example, in the famous famous uh, statement where Jesus asks him, what do, you, what do you think of me, Peter? Who, do, who are people saying that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so we have a lot of ideas about what a lot of people thought about Jesus. Um, but in particular, when we're, dealing with the, um, when we're dealing with the I am statements, we're looking at what Jesus thought about himself. 
And so Jesus has a series of sayings where he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the vine. Um, Now, when you look at these, at face value, they might not encounter you in any particular way. Um, because there's other places where, for example, Jesus might use the word I am, um, for even when he says to Peter, who do you say that I am? Um, but there's something special about these sayings. And if you have a look at it, when you look at it in the Greek, it has this structure, which is called, where Jesus says, ego, I me. Now, that's a little bit of Greek for you. I don't speak much Greek. Uh, I'm going to assume that many of you don't either. Now, the ego part is the same word that we get the root for ego, or like this personal identity, I. And then the I me is also kind of reiterating it. They can both function as I am, and this one says kind of like I exist. Um, And so if you were to translate it fully accurately, what you might see the reading to be would be I, I am. Now, it's a little bit of a weird structure, and you know, some of you guys may have encountered why this happens, why this doesn't. But if you were to look in the Old Testament, there's only one situation in the Old Testament where you start to see this structure. When they translated the Bible into Greek, you saw this one occurrence. Now, where the occurrence happens is during the time that Israel was in slavery. They were in slavery to the Egyptian Empire. And anyway, God ends up calling out this guy named Moses, who had become a famous prophet. And God says to Moses, and he encounters him in a burning bush, and he says to him, I have seen the misery of my people. I have seen their suffering. I am now sending you out to go and redeem my people. And Moses, being a little bit frightened and things like that, he says, well, who am I going to say sent me? And when you have a look at it in the text, it says, Ego, I me, I am. I am who I am is who sent you. And so this is the basis of the series that we're talking about, is that the claim that Jesus was making, the central claim about who Jesus thought about himself, his own personal identity, was an aspect of divinity. He was recognizing himself as the one who called out Moses from the burning bush to serve as someone who would redeem uh, his people. And so this is a divine claim that Jesus is making about himself. But then he adds on a couple of things, the bread of life, the vine, and things like that. And this is what we're going to be exploring over the next couple of weeks. So the first one, as you would have read, or as we would have read, is Jesus using the first of these great sayings, which is, I am the bread of life. So now we're going to, oh, excuse me, Um, i got to remember when I'm moving along the the slides, I'm also clicking the button. Um, So without going, with now going, I guess, into into the text or into the main part of this message is last week I had the opportunity of visiting, uh, watching, watching Toy Story 4 with my nephews and Uh, I'm not sure if you have encountered Toy Story or any of the kind of Pixar films. Uh, I'll make a confession. I'm a little bit of a fan of Pixar. Um, They make a lot of deep existential questions. They raise a lot of deep questions. And in this movie in particular, don't worry, I'm just going to flag it out there. I'm not going to give any spoilers away. This guy guy is in the trailer and everything like that. And this guy's name is Forky. Now, Forky has an interesting behavior. And at the beginning of the movie, he has a f- one kind of understanding about who he is. And he says, um, for example, he says, um, I'm not a toy. I was made for soups, salads, maybe chili, and then the trash. And this is how Forky started off with his identity. Is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not this, I'm, I'm that. And then anyway, um, something that Pixar does good is they develop the characters. And as you see the development of the character over the course of the movie, he asks this really deep question. And I know that this question went over my nephew's heads, but it's an important question. And he asks, why am I 
alive? And now this is a very important question, but I think in terms of tonight's message, is that you have someone or a character who understood something about himself and then began to re-understand his purpose in life in light of the fact that, you know, circumstances were changing and things like that. And so as we approach our passage tonight, we're going to be tackling this kind of question. And the main message that, um, that we'll give is that Jesus is the bread of God who gives eternal life freely to all those who believe and satisfies forever. Jesus is the bread of God who gives eternal life freely to all those who believe and he satisfies forever. And we're going to see this break up in three parts, in verse 22 to 27, then in verse 28 to, 30, 28 to 33, and then thirdly in verses 34 to 40. So, going on to this, oh, excuse me, sorry. Going on to this uh, first part. Okay, going on to the first part, is that before we go any, any further, the book of John, right at the end of it, attached onto the end of it, John tells us something about his gospel and the purpose of his gospel. And he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so what John is trying to tell us is that throughout the book, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was displaying signs about himself. And these signs, they were signifying or they were signifying something about Jesus. They were pointing to something about him. And these are what the signs are supposed to reveal to us. And so when we approach our passage tonight, right before this happens, right before this discussion happens, you see one of these signs at the beginning of chapter 6. And this sign is where Jesus fed the 5,000. Now, uh, for those who don't know, essentially what's happened is that there was a lot of signs that Jesus was performing and more and more people started to follow him. And they started to see him heal the sick and, and so on and so forth. And you en ended up having an enormous crowd starting to follow Jesus. And then Jesus ends up seeing this, and he goes up onto a mountainside, and then he, he asks the question to one of his disciples, and then he's like, where are they going to get all the food? Just to kind of see, see where they're at and what they thought of, of Jesus' abilities. And then anyway, Jesus was able to miraculously feed a number of people. And so this is the first context um, for the basis of our discussion. But then the next part, the next part of it is what was actually going on. And if you see at the beginning of chapter 6, in verse 4, it says, Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. <coughs> now, for those of you who don't know, it happens in an, the Passover happens during a particular period of time. And Roy has recently preached on, on some of these elements of the seasons and, and, and when you get uh, um, harvest, harvest time. And here you have the barley harvest. And this was during the time of the Passover. And so this is the kind of things that you might have seen in, in ancient Israel, um, the, the kind of atmosphere where it's just finished the winter and now you have crops starting to come up. And now people are starting to be encouraged that they might start to see food and new life and hope. The second aspect of this, the second aspect of Passover is not just an um, environmental one, but the second aspect is also a religious one because Passover reminds them of the time that God provided the manna from heaven or the bread and he gave it to them and he fed them for 40 years. And so they went throughout the desert for 40 years and they, um, and they were continually, reliably and faithfully fed by God. But it's a little bit bigger than just being fed this manner. It's the bigger context of what was happening. And this takes us back to the, the, the origins of the story, which is God says, I have seen the suffering of my people. 
and I am going to free them and I am going to release them from the bondage and the slavery of Israel. And so this is the context to which Jesus performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And I guess the reason why I want to raise this is it's a little bit like Christmas, the time of Christmas where, you know, in the lead up to it, as, as it's December, the, the year is slowing down, the work is starting to slow down, you're starting to relax, that, you know, the, the burden is off your shoulders and you start to look forward to Christmas and maybe you'll put up a tree and, and get presents and things like that and people are starting to feel a bit more festive and a little bit happier and a little bit more hopeful and joyful. And I guess this is the same kind of thing, is that without even the words being said, there is this sense within the ancient Israelites, that just as God saved his people back then, he's going to do something again. And I'll, to show you a bit of this, I'll, I'll give you a quote. And this quote is by a, a, a contemporary Jewish rabbi who, who doesn't believe in Jesus. And this is how he describes the period of Passover, which happened in the month of Nisan, which you can see as blocked out. And he says, in the month of the Passover... The Israelites were freed from Egyptian bondage. And in the month of the Passover, they will be freed again. And so every time the, um, the Jewish people would take part of this Passover and look forward to this Passover, they would be reminded that they are going to be freed again, that they will be redeemed by their God who has covenantally promised them he's going to do that. And so on this scene, you have Jesus then feeding the 5,000. And so they see something about Jesus. They see something about Jesus, and the next day or that evening, Jesus crosses, and they don't know where he is. And so now they're starting to, and this is where we kick off in, in um, verse 22, they start to try and find out where Jesus is. And eventually they have to cross over, and then they find him in the synagogue. And after looking everywhere, they finally find him, and they ask, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus responds to them. And it's a, little bit of a, it's a little bit of a hard response that he gives back to them. He goes, truly I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. And that's a pretty hard statement to, to make. But I guess... Before we jump to any conclusions, there's a little bit of extra context that might be worth providing. And that is what the meaning of bread is. And yeah, I thought it would be a, I thought I'd stick a Where's Wally thing in there just because there's a whole bunch of other bread that, anyway. So, <laughs> so the question is, what does bread mean to the Jewish people? Not only was it a reminder of Passover, but the thing was, was that in the ancient Roman Empire, there was an extreme amount of poverty. And you would have to spend maybe 85% of your income just on food. And a large majority of this food was bread. And this wasn't the high quality bread. This wasn't the wheat bread, which you know, the Old Testament would value as uh, twice as valuable as, um, as the barley bread. This was the barley bread. And they would have to invest a significant portion of their money. And so there's this natural concern always of where am I going to get my next meal from? Is God going to be faithful in this season, in this next season of harvest? And how, how am I going to pay for, for my family and be able to sustain my family? And so when Jesus comes along and he feeds them, he provides them something with exactly what they need. He provides them with food. And this is the same food that Jesus says to pray for. Pray for your daily bread. And so they start to see a messianic figure in Jesus. But see, the problem is, is that they had the wrong kind of picture of the messianic figure. The vision that they had of the messianic figure was one who would restore the glories of Israel. They had a vision of one who would be able to provide them the land of milk and honey, where there would not be this kind of struggle of day-to-day -day life of knowing what they're going to see. And so when we have a look at it in John chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, it says, when the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. And so when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, 
he withdrew. This is who Jesus started to become to these people, and they started to follow him. They saw the signs, and they started to follow him. And yet Jesus says, you didn't come to me because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And so I guess the first thing that I just want to raise is that it's easy to look at this crowd and think of them as foolish. But, you know, and it's a hard thing for us to be able to relate to because we're so distant from time and space and culture. We're not suffering from issues of malnutrition. Uh, we're not suffering from issues of poverty here at Grace Bible Church. And, and we live in a really nice country. So it's a little bit hard to connect our story and our lives to how we might relate to these characters in this story. But the point is, is that they saw that Jesus was someone who would provide for their needs. And Jesus said, you did not see me because of the signs, but because you had your fill. And that's the thing, is that for them, bread was life. Bread, it provided every single part of the security that they needed. And so the thing though is, is that for us, life the word life, it can have a lot of different meanings, uh, especially in the English language. So if we were to have a look at life, one, one way of looking at it would be is that if you were to ask, if you were to ask an older couple um, uh, about their, their marriage, they might say, we had a good life together. If you speak to a philosopher, he might tell you, I've spent my life trying to learn the truth. If you have a look and you read what Paul says, he says, pray that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness. And then finally, if you have a look at the um, prodigal son story and the son who didn't leave and he criticized the father for welcoming him back and he goes, he devoured your assets or the other way that it could be translated is he devoured your life. Now, the reason why I raise this is because this is not the life that Jesus is talking about in the next verse when Jesus says, but work for the food that endures to eternal life. No, the root of this life is called bios. If you were to look in the Greek, you'd see that the word is called bios. And this is not the word that Jesus uses when he says, work for the food that endures to eternal life. Now, you have another kind of life word that is used. The other kind is this one called suke. And so one example of this in the scriptures is that Jesus says he came to give his life up as a ransom for many. But that's not the kind of life that we're talking about either. And Leviticus also says that the life of every creature is its blood. And this is not the kind of life that Jesus is talking about, the kind of life that we should be working towards. Instead, Jesus uses a different word. And he says, this kind of life, it's called the zoe. And, goes, and where you might see this word being translated as life in our Bible is at the beginning of John where it says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And this word is talking about the very life that comes and emanates from God. It's the eternal life that exists within God. And Jesus has just told them, don't work for the food that perishes. Don't spend your life, don't spend your, your, your bios on the food that perishes, but work towards the food that endures to eternal life. This is the kind of life that he says. He says the eternal, eternal, um, eternal zoe. And then he says, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on them, on him. And so when we're looking at this and trying to relate our story and trying to understand how we might connect ourselves to these Jewish people, maybe we're not actually as distant as we think we are from them. You see, they were working towards what their hope was in. They saw the signs that Jesus was doing, and they started to put their hope that he might be able to provide them with what they need. Now, some of us might be here tonight and we might just be thinking, I'm spending my life towards a degree, or I'm spending my life towards a relationship, or I'm investing my life into my children, and God, I just, I need you to protect my children. 
and my hope is set in them. And Jesus is saying, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. And so the thing is, is that they saw Jesus as someone who could provide them for their needs, but they were looking for the wrong things. They weren't looking for the life that Jesus was talking about. And so this eternal life, it's not something that we can gain from any part of creation. It's not something that we can gain from any part of lifestyle or work ethic or anything else. Like I said, this is the very life that emanates from God. And here's the problem with that. The problem with that is that if you were to look in Ephesians chapter um, 2, you would see, and we just covered this, is that our sin, my sin, your sin, it has separated us from the life of God. And so the natural question that they ask is this question. What can we do to perform the works of God? Jesus has just said, work for this. So they have the natural question. I think they do. I think they've got it right. And they say, what can we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus says to them, and this takes us to our second point, is that first of all, is that he gives eternal life freely to all those who believe. And, the, and this is how Jesus uh, responds. He responds, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. Now, notice how he corrects a couple of their understandings. The first thing is that he uses the singular term work, not the plural term works. And he says, this is the work of God. And then what is that? That you believe in the one he has sent. But that's the second thing, is that they said, what must we do? to inherit eternal life, or to be doing the works of God. And he says, this is not something that you can do. This is a work of God. And so I guess the question is, now I know that a lot of people here tonight are, are, are Christians, and they say, well, I, I do believe in the one here sent. I do believe that. But then you might ask someone who might say, is a Muslim? And you say, do you believe in the one whom God has sent? And they'd say, yes. And talk to a Jehovah's Witness. Do you believe in the one whom he has sent? And they'd say yes. And the Mormon, yes. And even the Catholic, yes. So what is it about our belief in the one whom he has sent that grants us eternal life? I guess the question is, is do you believe that Jesus is able to do everything to reconcile you to the life of God that you alienated yourself from? Do you believe that Jesus is the only one who is able to reconcile you and save you from the condemnation and God's eternal wrath and punishment that you deserve? Do you believe that, that the death that Jesus died and the resurrection that happened three days later, do you think that's enough for you to be saved by God? Are you trusting in that? Are you trusting in that with all your life? And this is the kind of belief that we're talking about when it comes to believing in the works of God or to be believing in the work of God about who Jesus is and the one he has sent. Now, their question then starts to take a little bit of a different turn. And they say, what sign then are you going to do that we may see and believe you? What are you going to perform? Our answers, excuse me, <coughs> Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Just as it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so Jesus responds to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and brings life to the world. And I think that this is something interesting because we're focusing on the I am statements of Jesus and Jesus' self-identification of who he is and what he does. And this is, it's a, um, it's a uh, hymn that I, uh, that I like, um, and, and it has a lyric, I'll, I'll read them to you. It says, if to distant lands I scatter, if I, fail to the, if I sail to the farthest seas, would you find and firm and gather till I only dwell in thee? 
If I flee from greenest pastures, would you leave and look for me? Forfeit glory to come after, till I only dwell in, de- dwell in thee. Jesus says that the bread of God is the one that has come down from heaven. Jesus has just told you something else about himself. And that in order for the bread of God to be made available, the life of God to be made available for men to have and to believe in, this same God would have to forfeit his glory and enter his own creation. And I think that this is an amazing thing because so often we, we gaze into the heavens and we look at God and say, I don't need you, God. I am going to rebel against you. I'm going to lie when it pleases me. I'm going to lust when I like to. I'm going to gossip when, when it suits my circumstances. And we pursue all of these endless passions and pursuits And the result of it is a feeling in a world of emptiness and brokenness where God's judgment and wrath abides upon us. And so the maker of this world had to leave his glory. He had to come down from heaven so that life could be made available to the world. And yet he's there talking with them. He's there talking with his own creation. And they demand more. They say, what are you going to do? You just fed us. 5,000, but that's not enough. You just fed 5,000 men, but that's not enough. Moses, he fed us for 40 years. He fed us for 40 years, and, and, and we, we, were, we were filled. So what are you going to do? And I guess my point, brothers and sisters, is this, is it goes back to that other point where Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. Because if it was not up to, if it was up to us, we wouldn't believe in the one he has sent. We'd instead choose to continue to say, well, what sign do you perform, God? So often you can go out to the street and you can ask someone if they are going to heaven or hell when they die. And they just say, well, God just hasn't given me enough evidence. He hasn't shown himself to me. I demand another sign and another sign and another sign. And Jesus says, this is the work of God. That God would cause something in your heart that you would believe in the one he has sent. Now, there's this crescendo that is starting to build up to this boiling point of this dialogue that's happening between Jesus and the crowd. And I think Jesus has given them the right answers and he's been talking about the right things. And their response after this is saying, Sir, give us this bread always. And it's not something that they're saying now out of, they're saying, look, if this, is, if this is true, if you're saying that this bread is not just for Israel, but it is for the world, it's greater in scope, and that it's not one that perishes, but it endures to eternal life. So it's greater, not just in scope, but in its longevity. Give us this bread always. They don't know what it is, but they're asking for it. They're asking that, it, that they would get it. And the reason why is if you go back to it, they desperately want it. They desperately want a solution to their problems. So you can feel this tension that's starting to build. And so this is where we come to this point, where we come to that, our final point, where the God, or Jesus, who is the bread of God, satisfies us forever. And so at this point, they're waiting. Tell us, Jesus, give us this bread And Jesus responds to them, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. That's a bold statement. Not only that it endures to eternal life, but you will not need anything more than this bread, and you'll only need it once to take of me And I guess I have this question, why? Why can a God say this to us? And I guess I'll I'll give you this own story in my life. Now, I'm not sure if uh, many of you um, know too much about me, but a few years ago, um, I I was going out nightclubbing. 
a little bit. And, and I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a free spirit, and I, I, I really liked to dance. And now I've, I've uh, grown up in church, and, and uh, I had understandings of doctrine, and I had also started at ministry college, and so I had a good understanding of the Bible, or reasonably good understanding of the Bible. But there was this point in time when I started to disappear and fall away from God, and I just had this urge within myself. I just wanted to dance. And I just said, and I thought to myself, Lord, that's just a natural desire. Why would you, you've, you've, you've given me this, Lord. And so, you know, I'd start off on Tuesday night, I'd go uh, Brazilian martial arts dancing, it was called capoeira. Um, and then on Wednesday, uh, oh no, sorry, on Thursday night, I'd go ballroom dancing, uh, which was an interesting experience. Um, and then after that, uh, on Friday night, I would go to hip-hop dancing and I'd take on hip-hop classes. And every now and then, I would also try out a little bit of contemporary dancing. Now, yeah, <laughs> that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> now, that, that, that's, that's started to uh, characterize my weeks. And then after I'd do this, I'd go out to the nightclubs and, and I'd, I'd, I'd start to dance. And um, now I didn't dance, or I didn't go to the nightclubs to get drunk. I didn't go to the nightclubs to, to meet women or anything like that. I, I just wanted to dance. And this would be a frequent pattern for several months. And I just remember that something wasn't clicking one night. It just wasn't sitting right with me. And it was my friend, his, um, his mate was the DJ at the nightclub. And, um, you know, there's, there's this music going on and, and it's blasting around. And I just remember that even though I was surrounded by like this powerful music and I was surrounded by a lot of people that I ended up just feeling empty. I didn't feel anything. And as I'm just thinking about it and it just kind of hit me and it occurred to me that eventually the only way that I can make this good, the only way that I can make this satisfying again because that was, it was satisfying me for a moment. But like with this total emptiness, I realized the only way that it's going to satisfy me again or more is if I get drunk. And then it started to unravel a little bit. And I realized that eventually that drunkenness would come to this stagnant point and I'd need to search for something else. And maybe I'd need to get more drunk or I'd need to start taking some drugs or maybe I'd start to need to look for, for women or something like this. And it kind of unfolded at that point. Or, you know, one of the other habits that you see a lot of people doing is uh, going traveling and wanting to, to take photos and, and Instagram their life and their, their explorations of the world and these constant pursuits of trying to feel something. And it was at that point that I realized that all the joys that I was chasing in this life, all the happiness and all the pleasure that I was looking for and that I was looking to fill me and make me feel satisfied was temporal things. And as long as they're temporal things, they're just going to be fleeting and fleeting and fleeting. They're never going to actually satisfy. And that's why I needed to go and go back for more and more and more. And this is the nature of all sin, is that when we look to be satisfied in anything outside of Christ, it's going to be fleeting and it's going to disappear. And all you're going to do is be found empty. And it was at that point that I realized that the only thing, the only thing that is actually going to truly satisfy, the only thing that's going to eternally satisfy is an eternal God. An eternal God whose joy is eternal. An eternal God whose life is eternal. An eternal God who by his very being, everything that comes from him is eternal. Now, unfortunately, I, I, you know, I'd love to tell you that and then my life just churned and it was fantastic. But, you know, it was a long, it was a long road back. Um, but I guess that was, that was uh, an important turning point. I can't say whether I was a Christian or not because I knew the sound doctrine of, of, of the Christian faith. I don't know whether I was trusting in it. Some of you may have heard my baptism testimony last year. But the thing is, is that I was looking to find satisfaction outside of Christ. Now, when it comes to eternal life, this is how Jesus defines it. This is what Jesus says is eternal life. In John 17, in his high priestly prayer, he says, this is eternal God 
Uh, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. Eternal life is not going to church. It's not singing praise and worship. It's not studying good reform theology. It's not it's not understanding uh, your understanding of the church. It's not your understanding of the end times. It's not anything like that. It's do you know God? And are you satisfied in your life with that? Is Jesus a means to an end or is he the end in itself? Is Jesus the one who's going to, are you looking for Jesus? Are you looking for things so that, you know, you might be feeling happier in life? Are you looking for Jesus that he might bring you peace or a sense of, um, a better sense of self-worth in, in your identity? Like these are good gifts from God, but the God of the universe offers himself and he says, know me and have eternal life. And that's enough. That if you were to strip everything away, if you were to strip every material possession away, all of the life, all of that baos away, if you were to strip all of that away, if you were to lose your life, would you still have Christ? And would that be enough? Would you be satisfied and happy in that? Whether in good harvest or bad harvest, you know, not putting your hope in a, in a political system or looking for financial security from Jesus or anything like that, whether it's, uh, you know, um, whether it's even just trying to be freed from the brokenness or freed from the pain. Those are things that God gives, but that's not why you come to God. Come to God that you may know your creator, that you may know the one who made you and the one who wants to have a relationship with you. And so I guess that's the thing, is that if I lose everything, but all I have at the end of the day is Christ, it's enough. It's enough for me that I have Christ. So going to this, if I were to just rearrange, I guess, a little bit of the, 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 the message tonight, I'd change it a little bit and say, Jesus is the bread of God who gives himself freely to all those who believe, that you may know him and be satisfied forever. And so as we look at our verses in 36 to 40, there's a million things that we could discuss theologically. But because we're focusing on this I Am series, I think it's better that we find comfort in the promises of tasting the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If you come to me, promise one, I will never cast you out. I will never cast you out. Two, if you come to me, I will never lose you. Is that you come to me and you have no choice. I will not let you go no matter what. I will never lose you. And three, I will raise you up at the last day. I will raise you up at the last day. And so... Oh, I don't know how we got to the beginning again. Sorry. We'll get there. I'm quite disappointed because I'm pretty sure that it was just a blank screen that I wanted to get to, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. So those are the three promises that I will never cast you out, I will never lose you, and I will raise you up at the last day. And the question is, Lord, how can I believe you? How can I trust this from you? Why? Why would you never? And the thing is, is that his father's glory is at stake here. His Father's own glory is at stake here. God's unchanging nature is at stake here. His faithfulness and his ability to keep promises is on the line here. 
And so this is something that should give us comfort. When we look further on to the Garden of Gethsemane, he despised the cross and he said, if it would be any other way, but if it is your will, then, then I'll, I'll go. I'll go to the cross if it is your will. To suffer the eternal wrath of God, he would do it. And he says, this is also the will of my Father, though. And so I guess on top of all of those things is that it was the joy that set before him he endured the cross, that he might be seated at the right hand of God and function as the perfect king, priest, and prophet who would look after his own people. And there's some great comfort in that. There's a lot of great comfort in that. And so, I guess, going to this final, this final point, I, I have two questions. One is, do you believe in the one whom he has sent? Do you believe that Jesus is the one whom God has sent to save you from your sin? Do you believe that Jesus can reconcile you to the life of God and grant you eternal life? Now, if you do this, if you do believe this, I have another question. This is for my brothers and sisters. Do you appreciate enough what you have in Christ? Do you appreciate all the riches that are in Christ of just knowing him? Forget about the relationships in church. Forget about the theological knowledge. Forget about the ministry positions. Forget about everything. Do you enjoy that Christ is with you? It should, you know, when we, when we find our satisfaction, you know, I, I mean, I started this thing off, ironically, by, by uh, pointing to a, a movie that I watched <laughs> um, and, and, and the, the joys that I'm finding in that. But in another sense, I'm a bit challenged. That Why am I not satisfied in Christ enough? Why does he provide me sometimes, oftentimes, with the joy that I should have that I know God? Because I'm already satisfied. I know that theologically, that I'm satisfied. I know that I don't need anything more. But do I appreciate it enough? Do I love him enough? Do I understand it enough? And I guess I'll just leave that as a challenge for all of us tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are a wonderful God who sent your son to take our place that we may be reconciled back to you, that we might have eternal life in him whom you sent. Lord, I just pray that you would work that truth deep into our hearts. Let us be satisfied in it. Let us be content. Let us be content just to know you, Lord. Let nothing else hinder our way of enjoying you and that we have you and that you will never let us go. In Christ's name, amen.